it doesn't matter, okay? So you gotta be able to, in your own mind, say, okay, why am I learning this new tool? Why am I using it with my kids? And so I wanna talk about that a little bit today as well. These are some examples from uh, recent uh, news uh, media sources where people have been just handed technology, basically, and it hasn't necessarily worked. So you maybe have heard about, I'm in mean, California in the Los Angeles School District, they gave every teacher, every student an iPad, failed miserably. Why? They really didn't address the why they're using it, and they really didn't even talk about the how. Yeah. Uh, this is a recent article, this is actually from last week. Um, it's been circulated quite a bit in the last week. This one's actually from, I think, the Washington Post. But, you know, having computers isn't necessarily going to be the silver bullet, this magic thing that's going to help everybody. So, I don't think that technology itself makes you better, but I also think that it's too powerful to just say, I'm not going to use technology. And one of the things I'll talk about at the end, and it might kind of ruffle some feathers, is I don't think that we're at a place in 2015 where you can kind of sit back and go, yeah, I'm just not really a technology guy, okay? Because technology today is not about learning binary code or HTML code. It's about just being able to learn a skill. Technology. People are not saying, hey, you should use more technology because whatever you did before was a failure. It's just because we now have advancements that you didn't have before, okay? So I think anytime somebody says, you need to change what you're doing, and you're like, this has been working for like 10 years. Why do I suddenly need to change what I'm doing? It's not you, it's just that the tools have changed. So this lady was not doing anything wrong when she was washing clothes with the washboard, and she was really happy. I looked at a lot of it. I, I use this picture just because it amazed me that like she is super excited about doing clothes. Uh, maybe she's almost done. But she wasn't a failure, okay? It just we have more <coughs> technology available today. So it's not a personal thing when people say let's use more technology. Not be there in five years, but there's going to be something that's going to be connecting people in the same way. It might be better, okay, but it's not always going to be the same. So don't get too focused on the tool. Think more about okay, do I want kids to collaborate? Do I want kids to be able to write? Do I want kids to be able to communicate better? So this is something that our district's focusing on this next year a lot. It's the four C's. It comes from a 21st century, um, uh, 21st century. Back in the 21st century learning skills or whatever, it's like a national movement. So when I'm looking at what I want to do with technology in my classroom, I always try to think, okay, am I going to improve communication? Is this going to increase collaborative uh, collaboration? Is it going to increase critical thinking or creativity? So parents connect with that stuff on Facebook because they then see kids doing science experiments, they see people doing stuff um, in music class, they see students, you know, doing a project in a history classroom. And it just builds this like positive collateral with the community because then they get to see what you're actually doing and not just that headline on the newspaper that might be one person that is basically now representing like 10,000 people in this room. So just something that we'll talk about this afternoon, but you need to push out the positive things happening in your district and in your building and in your classroom or somebody else is going to tell their version of the story, which a lot of times the, the negative stuff gets more sizzle than the positive stuff. You don't even really realize that it's Jesse until right at the end, unless you know a little bit of Jesse James history. So when I read this book, I read it in like two days. When I got it, I read it in two days. And as soon as I finished, I was like, I've got to contact the author and see if she would do something with my class, because I want to do this as part of our curriculum. So I contacted Pat Hughes, who lives in Philadelphia. And this was back in 2000, 2007, no, 2006. And I said, you know, would you be willing to like, answer some email or something, and she was like, hey, I would, I'll do anything, you know, I'll contact your students, I'd love to get involved. And so, one of the things that we created to incorporate as many students as possible was a book blog. Now, it doesn't have to be a blog, it could be, you know, a website or anything like that. We chose a blog, because it's something that you could kind of add a lot of different types of things to. You could have pictures, you could have links, you could have comments, okay? So I wanted to find a way where I could have not only my second period class talk about this book, but benefit from somebody in fifth period saying something that might benefit someone in second period. So we had our entire um, building um, read the book. It took a couple of years to get some grants and stuff. We got enough copies so we could read it. And so I started a book blog back in 2007. And the neat thing was I could put a question up and then people could comment. And then as the teacher, the person that owned the blog, I could moderate the comments, so people weren't like just putting out comments, you know, this is the stupidest thing ever, and all that stuff. 
I could moderate and be the gatekeeper of all the comments, but Pat was also um, commenting on stuff. So we'd always have a question each week that would be like, ask Pat. And so these, these students could ask questions of the author, and then when she had time, she would go ahead and respond to them directly. Very, very cool experience to be reading a book, have access to the author, okay? We did a video chat later on. Um, I did this in 2007. It worked really well at Liberty. Um, the other thing is parents were involved. So now, once you have an environment where you have it out on the web, um, I had grandparents reading the book with their kids. Um, I had parents reading. I had some grandparents say, oh, this was great. I was able to read the book. We talked about it. Um, and it, it kind of built a community around reading it, and families got involved. But then I had some people that, again, followed me on Twitter and read my blog. And I had teachers in California, Minnesota. Um, there was one on the East Coast. They said, can we join you next year to do this? And so they joined us the next year. And so not only were my students participating, but theirs were as well. There's one part of the book where um, Jesse's house is burned down because they're supporting, uh, actually not Jesse, Matt. Uh, Matt's house is burned down because they're supporting the union. And so some uh, guerrilla fighters come and they burn down their, their house. And so one of the questions was, if your house was on fire, you know, what would you go in and grab if you had like a minute to grab something? Very interesting question for integrators to answer. We had some students in California that were part of our book blog, and they said, hey, that happened to me last year, because our house was in the, the forest fires, or the, uh, the range fires happened, and like their house actually, they had to evacuate, they had like, you know, an hour to get all their belongings out. So that was like a very real moment for them to kind of bounce back and forth. So circuit, you plug it into um, your uh, computer, and then what it does is it makes something else a key. That's why it's called a makey makey. So like anything that's conductive, you can attach to an alligator clip. And so like um, bananas are conductive, okay? Um, so if I attach a banana to the end of one alligator clip, then basically it's like I'm telling it, the computer I'm touching the space bar, or I'm touching the left key, I'm touching the right key, okay? I have, I brought a couple of them, so one of the things we'll do after the break is we'll have you guys play with them and stuff. But when I did the invention unit, I gave the students these and I said, okay, this is what this does. Now I want you and a group of three or four people to invent something. And literally in like five minutes, they're already coming up with like amazing things they can do. So like they have these pianos or game controllers where you're touching fruit and you know, using the different arrows and stuff. Um, they're creating different kinds of pianos. Anything that's a website that uses like up and down arrow keys, you can use in conjunction with this. Uh, students created pianos, kind of like on the uh, movie Big, you know, where you're dancing on the piano and stuff, so people do that. Um, this student created a game, kind of like Operation, where you had a metal uh, ring and you had to move it across. And he hooked it up so that it was hooked up to a Word document. So every time you touched it, it was like hitting return. And so it kept score of how many times you hit it on getting from one end to the next. Now if you're looking at this going, oh, this does not make any sense to me, once we start playing with it, you guys will get it. Um, it'll make sense. But like this guy created like a dub station, like a, I don't even know what that is, but it's like, you know, like <laughs> you're like a DJ and you want to touch this and it's this sound effect. Um, I've had students make controllers um, for different games. This one is like a Dance Dance Revolution game where you're stepping on pieces of tin foil. Um, this student created a ball that you can maneuver Google Earth with by like holding it in different ways. Oh, I'll have this out so you guys can keep writing. You guys yes. can try this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's up. So if you have like an iPhone or anything, if you want to download um, the Google Cardboard app, um, like Stop. I'll have my phone out and you can use it and stuff, but you could also use this if you want to. Stop. <laughs> whether I'm teaching a map or whether I'm teaching an historic event, um, whether I'm teaching a skill, if I can get my students personally invested, um, then I'm going to be able to uh, get them to learn that or help them learn that. So eighth graders don't get up in the morning naturally thinking about, gosh, today I'm super excited about learning about the Federalist, the Anti-Federalist, and whether they pass the Constitution and stuff. They want to know how that connects with them. And one of the ways that I've been able to do that with my students in the last two years is through a program that actually initiated with um, something that um, started with my grandfather. So this is my grandfather, uh, Henry C. Lane Marsh. And that's me getting a drink and with the hose there. So my grandfather, my dad's in the back, so if I did a motion, I'll just like some past me here. So my grandfather uh, is an immigrant that came from Germany. He fought in World War I in the trenches as a German Marine. 
Um, when the economy collapsed in Germany, he decided to come to America with his brother. He had an uncle that had already came over a couple years before, but um, he came through Ellis Island. Um, he's actually processed from Ellis Island on um, July 3rd, um, about 1929. Um, they wanted to rush him through because they wanted to celebrate the 4th of July. Came across, had no, uh, no clothes except what he had on his back, um, no money. Um, so he, had, he lived this incredible life. So my dad is a former history teacher, and my uncle's a history teacher as well. And back in about 70, I think it's about 76 or 77, um, at Christmas time, they decided to bring home a reel-to-reel -reel recorder. And my dad also was a media specialist at, uh, at the high school in Blair, Nebraska. So they brought home this reel-to-reel -reel recorder, they set it on the table, and they, at Christmas time, with the family around, they got my grandfather and my grandma to talk um, essentially about my grandfather's life. And so he talked about being in World War I, he talked about living in Germany, everything, starting a farm, eventually you know, becoming a farmer in Nebraska. And he talked for six hours, and they recorded the entire thing. And so over the years, those six hours of audio tape that we have have become you know, like a treasured item in our family. They got transferred from reel to reel to cassette tape, and then when I was in college, I transferred them from cassette tape to um, MP3. So now they're in digital format. Um, every grandkid, every great grandkid has a copy of this. And so we have this amazing insight into my grandfather. So once we started to get all these uh, laptops, I decided that I wanted to do something where my students would see value in collecting their own history. Because I want them to understand that history is not just about Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. History is all of us. It's just that some of them might not be as published as others. So I created a project last year called the Henry Project. Um, so the acronym is helping everybody know and record yesterday. So what I have my students do um, twice a year, so they have to do one in the first semester and once in the second semester, is they have to interview some family member for 10 minutes. And one of the reasons that you know they talked about getting a MacBook for our eighth graders through seniors was having the ability to use the camera, being able to record video. So they have this device they can take home and they have to interview somebody for 10 minutes. They then put their um, title on the front that says when they interviewed them, who they interviewed. They bring it in. I've got a external hard drive that I plug into their computer. We transfer, it takes about one minute. And then um, I burn three DVDs for them, give them the three DVDs. Um, most of them give one copy to the person they interviewed. And then I tell them to put the other somewhere where they'll be safe, maybe a safe deposit box or give them to your parents. And so my students did that this year. I have them do a little, uh, kind of like a, a Google form at the end. And it's amazing, because some of my theaters are like, I don't really know why I'm doing this, you know, whatever. But the vast majority of them are like, wow, this is really cool. I talked to my grandparents, and I asked them how they met, you know, and I never knew, you know, how they met. Um, and it's cool, because I have them fill out a little thing saying, what's the most interesting thing you learned as a result of the project? And some of them are just like, super comical. I never knew my, my grandma taught bowling. Um, you know, I didn't know that, uh, you know, they learned to cook in the army or whatever. They tell all these different stories. So just making it personal and making that connection with technology. Um, I know that 20 years from now, that's going to be pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. so, Twitter ceased to exist. Um, I would be extremely sad. I would feel like I've lost tons of connections. And I, like almost everybody that started Twitter, thought that Twitter, the first two weeks that I used it, was useless. Okay, so it was back in like maybe 2000, 2008 maybe, 2009, and enough people had told me, hey, you should get on this thing, that I finally just made an account. And there's kind of like this period for the first like probably month or so where you're like, this is insane. I don't know why I'm on Twitter. We really no value to it. And then for different people, it clicks at different times, but eventually you kind of get to the point, most people get to the point, when they realize, hey, this is really a valuable tool. So you're like constantly striving to be better, okay? Um, like you might have a really good day when you come home and you're like, man, that lesson today, like that was, that was almost as good as I could get. I mean, it clicked, the kids got it. I mean, you know, it was awesome. But you almost never have like a perfect week and you definitely never have a perfect year. I mean, I'm already, I got a list, I keep a lot of books and journals and stuff. I already got a list of like the stuff I need to improve next year. I'm like, you know, getting to know my students better. And, you know, I got to do some more things with collaboration. I mean, like all these things that I want to do just a little bit. 
And I think that technology provides you kind of that ability to kind of tinker with something that's kind of fun and maybe more engaging and you can kind of like up your game constantly um, by kind of thinking about some ways that you can incorporate technology.